Welcome into the Pursuit of Manliness podcast, where we are vigorously equipping men to pursue biblical manliness. My name is Jarrett Samuels. I'm the host of the podcast. As always, thank you for taking time and checking out today's show. If this is your first time coming across the Pursuit of Manliness in any format, I want to say welcome. When you get a chance, make sure you visit thepursuitofmanliness.com. There you can sign up for the email newsletter. You can see all the social media links, what's available in the gear store, you can find out about Point Man and about Tribe. At the time of this podcast premiering, there is about six days left to register for the next session of Tribe, which begins June 1st, but registration ends on Saturday, May 22nd, 2021. We only open registration up twice a year. The commitment is for six months. So once we close that door, we send all the stuff out, we get moving, we hit the ground running pretty quickly. So you want to make sure you secure your spot in the next session of Tribe today. So what you're about to hear or you're about to watch, depending on what platform you're, you're leaning into here, is a conversation we had in Tribe recently about discipleship. And what we did is we took a question from Patrick Morley's book, uh, How God Makes Men. And he was a recent guest on the podcast and a book that we've been going through as a tribe. And on our regular scheduled uh, Zoom call, uh, we had a handful of questions we were going to go through. We only got through one question, and it was the question that we're about to unpack here on this podcast. And so at the end of the conversation, I thought, man, that was a conversation that more men need to be a part of. Uh, we had 20 plus guys on the call. I don't know how many jumped in and, and engaged as far as adding to the vocal conversation that you're about to hear. But regardless, uh, the conversation was one that we were greatly um blessed because of, but I also believe that you will be as well. So I told the men, hey, wasn't planning on doing this, but I'm going to use that as a podcast because I want more men to hear this as far as our responsibility as men to be disciples who make disciples. Amen. So guys, it's time for today's show. Well, guys, uh, thanks for hopping on. Let's get into this tonight. <clears throat> um, if we don't get through those questions tonight, we will more than likely pick up on this topic on Thursday. I have a feeling we could be in this a while, but we'll see. Uh, let's start with Patrick Morley, page 137. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to ask us, what do we do with that? So he writes, uh, page 137, God sees these problems too, and he has a solution. Making disciples is God's designated way to release the power of his gospel on every problem we face but we have to do our part. Scriptures frame disciple making as a moral issue. By that, I mean making disciples is a choice between right and wrong, obedience and disobedience. So how do we explain or how do we unpack what Patrick Morley is saying here? This is a difference between right and wrong, obedience and disobedience. Well, I'll just, I'll just throw my thoughts out there on this. Um, I have written in, in the side that we are called to um, tell people about Jesus and to uh, tell them the truth about God's truth. And that is discipleship making, uh, leading people to Christ. And, you know, so if, if we're not obedient in doing that, and then it says this will, I believe I've read somewhere, I can't remember where it was, but disobedience is a sin. Um, and, and so I, I just want to make sure that when, when I'm doing, when I'm talking to somebody, I'm talking to them about Christ and about his love and his grace and his mercy, uh, because I want them to experience that and, and grow in Christ, which is discipleship. And so I want to make sure that I'm obedient to that and I'm not sinning and being disobedient to that calling. So I don't know if that makes sense to you. It makes sense in my mind. Um, but that's, you know, to kick it off and start, start with. I, I guess I'll kind of follow up with that. In the next paragraph, I highlighted this. When he says how we face the truth about disciple making will determine whether we become part of the solution for our world or remain part of the problem. And so you're either you either for God and for his purpose or you're not. So you so you're either with God or God's at war with you because you're not obeying him. So there's no middle ground. There's no no man's land here. It's this is a two sided front. So so, yeah, like you said, Matt, you're either obeying God and fulfilling his purpose 
making disciples or you're not. And so it's either, you know, you're part of the solution or part of the problem. So well, it kind of struck me. I never and really looked at it from this aspect. It's like, yeah, so I don't really have anybody I'm discipling and stuff. And that's just the season I'm in and, and that. And it's just like, no, that's not how this works. So that kind of kind of shook me a little bit on that one. Yeah, that whole uh, page kind of convicted me that like probably a lot of us, you know, we, we see the problems in the world. We think about it, worry about it, complain about it, do lots of things. And, and I'm, I'm spending a lot of energy on things that aren't on that page. So I ought to be focusing my energy on discipling people, getting people to Jesus and spend the time doing that and not spending time consternating doing some of the things that I'm spending far too much time doing. I think that's a good point, Rob. It's easy to, I don't know, get in our own little funnel, you know, our own little, you know, this is what I see and this is the challenges I see in front of me. But I think there's something that different that happens when you begin to do life on life with someone else, when you begin to realize you're responsible to other people. And it's like what I talked about a couple weeks ago on that filling up your thermos so that you can empty it out. There's a purpose. There's even a purpose of why we're doing this. There's a purpose why we get in the word so that we can pour into the life of someone else. When Jesus told him, you know, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It starts with the following Jesus and then the fishing of men and, I used to believe for the longest time that discipleship was for the, the missionaries, the pastors, the super Christians, the, the theologians. And we're talking just tonight in our small group that, you know, while God used Luke and Paul to write a substantial amount of the new Testament, they were the, they were the smart ones. Um, <clears throat> he used regular guys, blue collar guys to turn the world on its head when they receive power from the Holy Spirit to plant churches, make disciples, evangelize the lost. And while we may not all be, you know, great theologians or great fishers of men or whatever, we're all called to be disciples who make disciples. And I said that it really hit me a couple of years ago. When you think about Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples. If a non-believing friend of yours found your Bible and found that portion of scripture and asked you, so how are you doing with that? What does that mean? And we tell them, I don't, I don't know. I'll get around to that. You know I mean? That that's, that's the Holy spirit convicting us that we need to be men on, on mission because if we keep doing what we're doing and just sitting on the sidelines, like the old men on the Muppets complaining about the show, but never getting involved in it, we're, we're going to leave a lot of battles for the next generation to fight that, that we should have fought. And the only thing that really changes anyone is Christ. And the, the best thing we can do is get people to Jesus. Um, sometimes that's building up people who are already there. And sometimes that's getting people to him that, that have no idea who he is. And I think what you're saying, I think that's what Satan does. I mean, I think he, he tries to tell you, you're not enough. You're not good enough. You got to work on yourself do all kinds of things before you can go out and do this great mission. And like you said, you know, it doesn't take the super Christian because it doesn't really matter who I am. It's who God is. So God's God can do all things. So if I just am willing to participate and just willing to go out and, and, you know, put my foot in the water, he'll, he'll make it work, but you got to get off the sideline and, and go get after it. Not just sit on your couch and you know, hope somebody knocks on the door. And, and that's, that's a good point. I never considered that, but when you think we do try to get ourselves right or, you know what, for the next year, I'm going to buckle down and I'm really going to, you think about Peter, man, he really messed it up. And uh, he had three years walking with Jesus. Then he gets about a, about a month plus 40 ish days. And he's preached one of the greatest sermons the world's ever heard. And it starts off with the idea of repent and be baptized. I could just repent. I get repent, get right with God. And Peter just lets it rip. And I think if we just let it rip, we can talk about a lot of topics, Pez, sports, gas, the weather. It's not that we lack words. We typically lack the courage and we need to pray that the Holy Spirit gives us the courage and the boldness 
and humility to say, hey, use me. I'm going to do this because you told me to do it. So the results are up to you, God. I don't have to worry about the results. I mean, how many times, you know, just in this session at trial, we're going through the Old Testament. We talked about just guys being willing. I mean, it was just willingness. It wasn't, wasn't some great skill. I mean, it was just put me in the game, put me in coach, you know, and, and just be ready to go. You know, I, I think what Jared said, you know, that lack of courage for me, it's, you know, being embarrassed in front of a group of people or, um, you know, thinking that I don't have the words at that point in time, or, you know, what are they going to think about me after this meeting or after this, uh, cup of coffee, uh, you know, I'm so hypocritical sometimes. Do I, and, and am I, do I even get to tell people about Jesus because of my hypocriticality, you know, or how I think about myself? And, you know, I just wrote down, you know, I lack courage. And that's, that's one thing I need to do. I need to have that, that courage and that strength to be able to do that and consistently be obedient in that calling that purpose really that's that's what our purpose is i know matthew i know i feel the same way with with courage and not having the words and you know i'm not a great order and i i get nervous trying to pray especially if people are listening so i mean all those things come into play but there's so many times in the bible it talks about the holy spirit will give you the words and you know and sometimes even imperfect words god can use them to be perfect and and still accomplish the task at hand, I think. And after watching Jared's interview with Patrick Morley, and for Patrick Morley to say, I started a men's discipleship group in the 1980s, and we never once stopped that. And that has been our sole ministry of discipling men. I, I was blown away whenever he said that. I thought for sure it would be something totally different. But um you know, that's what they did. That's what he started with. That's what he stuck with. And that's what he's still doing. And uh, I mean, that, it just blew me away. So I'm saying that because Patrick Morley is practicing what he preaches. I mean, we, we had proof that, yeah, he's, he's really doing this. And I'm way behind that, that curve. Well, I think an issue we run into is, is what kind of time frame do we put on discipleship? How long, how long do you? How long does it take to disciple somebody? Um, someone is mature when they're when they can reproduce, right? I mean, we measure human beings by that level. Maturity comes at a point when they can, you know, reproduce. I think disciples are the same way, um, and and I don't think that I've always kind of had this saying in my life that everybody's somebody's disciple that means you are and your kids are and if if we're not intentional about it i promise you our enemies are and and the forces of evil are certainly intentional about the discipleship that is taking place in the lives of those around us so uh, that process of discipleship i think one of the big barriers i see a lot of people take with it is is they want to put a time frame on it. They want to do it, you know, I want to do this for a year. I want to do this for, for six months. I want to disciple this person and then hand them off. And that may not be the time. And I think when people put that time frame on it and, and it they don't see the maturity that they anticipated, they chalk it up as a failure to themselves. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, a, it's difficult. And I think men struggle with it even more because, we like to see um, we like to see results quickly. I guess I would say we do, and we don't like to feel ineffective. And that's one of the things with discipleship. We can't fix somebody. You know, you can't make somebody do or live certain ways. And I don't want to replicate another version of myself. You know, I, I got that living in my house, so I, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is do my best to get them to Jesus through a relationship, hopefully get them to Jesus. And like you said, AC is to implore them to do the same thing. I had a guy who mentored me for 
uh, you know, seven years. And right from the very beginning, part of the deal we, we signed was I would in turn do this um, after he and I were done, you know, and it was like, at the time you're thinking, there ain't no way, right? Discipleship's the same way. If you do it with the right heart, you're thinking there ain't no way. And um, what you realize is what God will do through an obedient man is, is quite remarkable. You know, and I, when I read the book, I never saw Patrick Morley before. I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know anything. I didn't know he wrote other books, to tell you the truth. Um, he's one of the kindest men I've ever come in contact with. And to read what he wrote, I'm expecting like a Mark Driscoll, UFC kind of guy to show up on the Zoom call and, and yell at me. And he was one of the nicest guys immediately. I mean, he looked at me and said, we're brothers. And I was like, okay. So, you know, just a good hearted guy who wants men to love Jesus. And I think that's the key. You, whatever approach you take, just get them to Christ. I do think we, we want to see the end result, but that's not always how it works. I mean, I may plant a seed in someone that the fifth person down the line who tries to disciple the person actually sees the end result when somebody comes to Christ. And it's, it's you know, I'm just a cog in the machine. I may not be the end on be all to any one person that you're trying to disciple. You're just doing your part. Maybe you will be the one person they look back upon and say, that person really shared Jesus with me. I came to Christ through them or through, the, but it may just be, man, that person just did one thing one time and put a little seed in there. And God grows that way down the line, 10, 15 years down the line. And that turns them into Christ. It brings them in, in to walk with Christ. Well, I mean, that's just like that. That's just like tithing, right? So, so think about tithing. If we, if we're thinking kingdom minded and we're thinking long term, you know, I give my ten percent this week and this week and this week. I may never ever see the result of my tithing. I may never, but when I get to heaven, generations from now, people are going to say, you know what, Matthew, because you tithe, the, this church was able to build this church, and that's the reason why I became a Christian. I knew I became a Christian because I was fed at that church. And to Rob's point, we may never, ever see the result of our efforts until we get to heaven or until that other person gets to heaven. And I think we, we've also got to think about, you know, we've got to think about the long game. We can't think about just the short game, even though that's important too, but we got to think about the long game and just building, you know, God's kingdom. Matthew, would you, uh, based on what you just said there, would you see disciple making a discipline, just like you would see prayer, scripture reading, tithing, um, fasting, would that be a required discipline then that we need to teach, we need to hone, just like other disciplines we're, we're practicing all the time in here? I Yeah, I, I think so. And and we need to teach that. And, I mean, if you, you were reading, you know, his book and we're on page – you know, 137, right? Is that what page we're on? 137. If you just flip it over to 138 and you read the second sentence, it is every Christian's ministry and duty starting at home. But that's the only thing we can take with us to heaven is the souls of our, our family and, and the people that we come in contact with. We can't take our houses, our money, our, our jobs, nothing. But it all starts at home. And, and yeah, I think it's got to be a discipline, Mitch, to what, you know, like what you're saying is that we've got to try to do that all the time. We've got to strive to do that. And when we have conversations with people, we should love them so much as a, as a, and honor them as a child of God that, that we have, we feel an obligation to tell them about it. And I'll even add to your point, Matt, I think, Disciple making is not only as much as getting people to Jesus. I think on another side of the coin, it's part of our sanctification process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in order to be an effective disciple maker, 
like you, to your point, you have to be faithful and diligent in the disciplines of the faith. Otherwise, you're not going to be very effective at disciple making because you're not practicing what you're preaching. So I very much so it is part of your own sanctification process. So it's a twofold purpose, I think. Yeah. And I like how Matt said it's, you know, something you have to be committed to. Um, we're not a society of commitment by and large. We're a society of immediate gratification, right? We want to do something, see something happening as a result so we can move on to do something else to see something happen as a result. And so, you know, disciple making has to be something, you know, it's easy. We have a Zoom call, you go to a retreat or revival or something, right? And you come out on fire and you're excited and you want to go save the world. And in three days, you don't remember anything about it, right? Because that excitement just, that fire just burns out. Well, at some point, we have to be able to turn that fire and excitement into commitment. And, and that's where people drop off on things, right? Is we just not very good at transitioning from one thing to the other. Um, and I, I like what Shane said, too, about, you know, it's part of our sanctification process. You know, if you're discipling someone, I, th I thought about discipling someone as, you know, introducing them to Jesus, bringing them hopefully to Jesus, but then also walking with them through spiritual maturity. Well, if you're going to guide somebody else through spiritual maturity, you better be guide, be progressing through spiritual maturity too, right? Because otherwise they're going to catch you and pass you if, if God willing. And so if you're not progressing, then you're going to be limited in your ability there to really affect the kingdom in a positive way. I think back several years ago, we were doing um, like a couple small group at our church and um, the pastor and his wife were, were part of it and, and me and my wife and we had a couple other families and we got to talk about how we didn't have a Sunday school class for like young parents or, or parents of young families, um, which was kind of the stage of life we were in at the time and, and I guess in, in a way still are. And so we started looking around the room and we had the pastor. Well, obviously he's busy Sunday morning. We had the pastor's wife, well, she's got stuff to do Sunday morning. My wife was helping with the children's ministry. And we started going down the list and there was one person left that wasn't already doing something on a Sunday morning. And you're looking at it, right? So I get nominated now to go lead this small group. Never done it. Never even really been in a small group. Felt very unqualified. So the pastor sends me to this other church where they have classes to help build up leaders, right? Teach you how to lead a small group. What do you have to do? And I don't remember a whole lot from it, but I remember one thing and it has stuck with me. Um, in the process of discipling or in leading a group, there's three roles that have to be filled. There's your role, God's role, and their role. When you do your role, you're in good shape. When you try to do one of the other two along with your role, stuff doesn't work. You can't be the Holy Spirit, you can't be God, and you can't make the other person choose that route for themselves, right? You have to do your role, let the Holy Spirit work and get out of the way. And I, and I believe, I, I believe the enemy of our soul has made the word discipleship something it was something that's so intimidating that the average guy, if he comes and sits on Sunday or watches online, when he hears that word, he says, I'm out. That's not me. I don't have time for that. I don't, you know, I, man, I would, but I'm, I'm so busy. We're either so busy or we're afraid we don't know enough. And I, it's like, God, I wish God would just tell us, I don't need you. Okay. So you're, you're irrelevant to this story. I can do this without you, but I'm going to work. Through, you're a conduit of the gospel. I'm going to work through you so that life on life. And what I have found in discipleship is while I think I'm imparting knowledge and wisdom and discernment onto them. And, and hopefully there is some of that. I walk out with hopefully just as much as they got and thinking, I never thought of it that way. Or to hear someone ask a question about scripture when they've never read it for the, you know, for the first time, it, it is fascinating. I think about Jesus said in John 13, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, all people. If you have love for one another, we live in a time where it's popular to say how much you love your neighbor. The most loving thing we could do for our neighbor is to show them the love of Christ. And we do that through discipleship. We do that through life on life. And it's, it's not supposed to be this intimidating. It's, it should be life giving. 
you know, like you talk about Patrick walking out of a conference and you're fired up. The reason why we're fired up from those things, I believe, is because we've removed all other distractions. And all we did for that three days or three hours was focus on God. The same thing happens in discipleship. I do it at five guys once a month. I do it, you know, you can do it wherever. And when you walk out, your your thermos is filled back up. And, and then you have more that you can give to someone else. But if you just sip on what you have and never give to anyone else, eventually we're, we're going to run dry. And the Christian life is going to seem boring and irrelevant to us. Yeah, you know, you say it, it, the word discipleship feels really intimidating. I don't know what it's like at, where you guys go to the church. I mean, at our church, if we can get guys to take their hands out of their pocket and sing along to the worship music, like we really accomplished something, right? So to actually think that they're going to go out and talk to somebody that they don't already know about Jesus, only God could be so bold as to expect that, okay? Um, and I don't know about y'all. For me, you know, the times where I've, I think, had the most effect in discipling others is not at church on a Sunday morning. It's in the gym, it's at a baseball, it's, it's, it's wherever, but it's rarely, you know, at church on Sunday morning. It's kind of funny y'all say that the, the man that sort of led me to Christ, I went into the meeting with an attitude of, if this guy throws the Bible at me, I'm out. And I walked into Ruby Tuesdays in Michigan and this dude's sitting in a Russian hockey Jersey. And I don't know that, he said anything in that first meeting other than a bunch of small talk, but I agreed to meet with him once a week. And then, then some things started to move, but you know, I always think back, man, you know, God knew if, if, if I put this dude in a, in a hockey Jersey, it's going to sort of disarm all of the defenses I'd put up, you know? So I do think trying to kind of get on somebody, get off, get out in the sort of foreign turf a little bit is not a bad idea. I think the hard part for me is, you know, especially if you, you have kids, you know, you, you teach your kids how to play ball. AC, I'm guessing you're not a pro baseball player, but yet you taught your kids how to play ball. You know, I'm not a pro fisherman. I can teach my kid to cast, you know, there's all these things that we do that we're not professionals that we're not, but somehow when it comes to this topic, we think we have to be professionals and I can't, I mentally myself cannot figure it out. If it's something to do with, I'm not confident enough at all in my ability here. And that's why I, I'm trying to be better than I'm not ready. To, I feel like I'm not ready. To, or if there's just something to that whole, like we we've built it up so much. I wish somebody could crack it for me because I just feel like I am willing to do the, the show, the fruits of the spirit to somebody, but i never point them to the tree. Like I can live it, but I don't say, but that's because of Jesus. And I, I don't do that for some reason. And I just, I can't crack it. Jeremy, I'm glad you said that. Cause that's pretty much exactly the same way I feel. I mean, you couldn't have described that any better. That's you and I are on the same struggle bus there. I think. I, I, I would just say, I, I think this is one of the places we don't give the enemy enough credit we're easy to attack here, right? It, our, all of our insecurities bubble to the surface when it's, we start talking to other people about Jesus because we immediately become, or I immediately become aware of all the places I fall short, right? I'm the, if, I, if I say Jesus, anything, I'm the biggest hit. Like I can't go there because they're going to see right through me. And I think it's just one of the places where we just don't give the enemy enough credit as to where he attacks us. Well, I think too that we, we often forget that we were made uniquely and the way that I disciple someone isn't going to look like the way that, that Jarrett would do it as a pastor. And I'm helping a friend right now set up a ministry and he's an evangelist. Um, he wouldn't call himself that by, by name. He's, he's a pastor, but he's straight up an evangelist, but his whole ministry is going to be centered around discipling men and connecting with them really in the outdoors, but where they want to connect with. So he's a biblical counselor, but he's not going to be a guy that sits in an office. He has, for the last 15 years, had so much success discipling men when he's like, what do you want to do? And they're like, I want to go fishing. Okay, let's go fishing. And what do you want to do? I want to go hunting. Okay, let's go hunting. Let's go hiking. Let's go sit by the fire behind my house. 
And I think too often for myself, um, I, I will over spiritualize it. Like I've got to turn it into a Bible study. Like I've got to turn it into this, this time where we're going to sit down and dig into scripture. And that's not necessarily what men in the beginning need. Oftentimes we have so many walls built up that we need someone that's just going to sit there and be a friend and listen. And yes, we'll bring wisdom into it, but we don't have to beat them over the head with the Bible. Now, if you have an agreement going in that we're going to sit down and study God's word, that's one thing. But if it's, you know, welcoming a new guy into relationship, relationship happens by getting to know them. And, you know, I think too often we're trying to almost over spiritualize it versus having the relationship in it. And I'm not saying not to share the truth. I'm pretty adamant that, you know, you let a person know where you stand with Jesus and, and, and you work that into the conversation where it makes sense, but God has made each of us unique and I'm not going to connect with a guy the same way that you guys are. And you're not going to connect with guys the same way I am. And I think that's the beauty in it is we figure out how, how do we connect with men and how can we use that to our advantage to take the gospel to new places? And I was on the phone with a guy tonight. We're talking about um, street evangelism that he and I have done in the past together. And he's in a new church and we're talking about it at my church and we're kind of excited about it. That is not for everybody. And I'm not talking evangelism where we hold up signs and scream at people, but to go talk to strangers on the street is not something that most people are comfortable with. Um, I really enjoy it. And it's something that, that I've done the last few years and I'm comfortable in it, but not everybody's going to be down with that. So, and I've told people that's okay. Figure out what you're comfortable with and go do that. And if, and if it's, you know, AC talking to other dads at baseball games and building relationships with them, and then, you know, building a discipleship relationship that way, that's the beautiful thing of how God made each of us. We don't have to do this in one prescriptive way. So I'm going to ask a real in the weeds practical question. So what does that look like when it goes from a relationship to now we're going to talk about Jesus? Like that is like the moment where I'm like all lost at sea because it's, it feels like, Hey, we've got this great, you know, conversation going. Like we'd like to talk about this stuff. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's talk about how the, the brewers are doing this year. Awesome. You know, not so awesome, whatever. Hey, by the way, uh, do you know, Jesus click. You know, I, I, that, I think that is the moment where I, I struggle the most. Like, how do you make that transition? And maybe that we don't want to go here right now, Jared, I don't want to side, you know, sidewind us, but um, that's what I'm always wondering. I think it's a great question. I was sitting here thinking this, I was going to end with an idea that these conversations aren't meant to make us feel bad. They're to make us mm-hmm. think, you know, so to make me think about what am I really doing with what I believe? Do I believe what Jesus said about make disciples? And if I do, Jeremy, you're spot on. There has to be a point where we say the words discipleship or something, and you can word it however you want to word it. You know, you want to have best friend time every Tuesday at nine. I mean, I wouldn't do that with a grown man, but um, I think you look at Titus chapter two, where Paul says older men are to teach the younger, you know, and I think sometimes older for us might be older in the faith than younger in the faith. So we can be the same age, but maybe I'm further along, whatever. Um, The first thing Paul tells us be, you know, sound doctrine and self-controlled. If we could teach people to be self-controlled today, that would go a long way. But there does come that point, like when you, if you're married and if you're dating, you can't be both. So if you're married or dating, there came a point where you had to say, will you go out with me? Like, I like you. I'm done flirting with you. I'm done playing this game. I'm, you know, like I want to date you now. The same is true with discipleship. At some point we have to find a way to say, Hey man, it's been on my heart or me and God's really convicted me about this. At some point we have to say that to them and tell them, let's start with a conversation. And that's where the conversation gets a little more real beyond sports and politics to, Hey, why don't we, once a week, once a month, once whatever. And let's go through a chapter of the Bible or something like that. That's my perspective. That's what I do. Josh was talking about over-spiritualizing it. Jarrett, you mentioned earlier on talking about um, like the difficulty of just wrapping your head around discipleship. Like, what does that look like? And Patrick was talking about his three things where if you just do your part and let God do his and the other people do theirs. I think the one word that everybody has kind of danced around, or at least the way that I look at it is if you have a hard time looking at it in the word discipleship, look at it from the word mentorship. 
because a lot of times when I think discipleship, um, if you don't know anything about it, you're like, man, where do I even begin? But if I hear the word mentorship, immediately I go to, I have to lead by example. And if I lead by example, all these other things we're talking about are falling into place then because you lead them by example, you're having those conversations. And then as people see Christ in you through your leaders or through you setting the example, it opens those doors and makes those conversations much easier because it's not kind of out of left field for, whoa, Jesus, here he is. Now they're like, hey, something about you is different. What is that? Ted, that's exactly what I was about to, to say kind of to Jeremy's response to Jeremy was a lot of times God has provided that opportunity for me like because I, I feel like I wear my face on my sleeve pretty well. You know, it's, it's not nobody ever has to, to look around and and it may be from different patterns how they how they recognize my faith. You know, at the ballpark, it, it could be really weird. Cause some of those guys, man, the, the language can be ridiculous. And, and they'll hear me just instead of, you know, yelling out a, a you know, a curse word, I'll be stagnabbit or, you know, <laughs> some just some something silly. But, oh, wait, oh and then, then they always apologize. And, and probably more often than not, my opportunities to talk about someone and say, hey, you know what it means to follow Christ. You know what it means to 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 be a Christian. You know, it, it will all ultimately almost always end up with when they apologize to me for something they did that they think offends my religion or my beliefs. You know, oh man, I'm I'm sorry. I know you're I know you're a good I know you're a good Christian guy. I know you're a religious guy. I, I'm sorry that I use that language. And, and my immediate response, I always feel like that's God pushing me through the door, you know, not opening the door for me, not, not getting his foot in the door. That's God pushing me through the door say, all right, you wanted a chance. You prayed for the chance. Now here's your chance. So I've always approached that opportunity with, and, and looking for that little way that God has given me that wedge to get in and, hey man, let's talk about this. Or it, it may be, and Jeremy, this may be the long thing. It may be that your attempts to, to bring up you know, hey, let's you want to read the Bible or you want to go to Bible study, you want to go to a men's event at our church. They may all be told, you may be told no to all those. But at some point in, in that person's life, there's going to be a moment where they need prayer. They they have come to a point of needing prayer. And you're the only person they know that prays. So they're going to come to you about it. <laughs> so God is going to God is going to open that, give you that window. Uh, my advice and my, my, you know, action that I always take is try and bust through it anytime you get a chance. Um, and it's generally, you know, fairly, fairly obvious that it's there for you. No, I appreciate that. They, all those responses give me something, some piece to think about, you know, the, the part of like, is it obvious, you know, because if it's not obvious, then maybe that's part of the problem. And then, you know, if it is obvious and people are opening that door, then am I, am I taking that step through it? So I, that gives me a lot to chew on. Thank you. So man, once again, thank you for checking out the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. If you would make sure you click subscribe, that way you never miss any Pursuit of Manliness podcast, audio or video content. If you're watching us on YouTube, again, click subscribe, make sure you share this with your friends. I always appreciate feedback and comments that you guys have to offer. And once again, if it hasn't passed already, Saturday, May 22nd, 2021, make sure you secure your spot in the next session of Tribe. There's some things going to happen in this session that you just simply don't want to miss. Men, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Let's keep pursuing biblical manliness.